You know, our scripture reading uh, today is still in the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, and we're um, uh, going to continue of the, the third of these parables that Jesus told uh, in this setting. Uh, we've heard about uh, the shepherd who lost one of the sheep, and he went looking for that sheep. And a woman who lost a coin, and she went looking for that coin. Now it's two brothers and a father. Uh, and something that happens now that I, I want to share. A fairly familiar story, but I invite us to listen to it fresh. Uh, you can turn in your scriptures uh, in the Pew Bibles on page 78 or your home Bibles. I encourage you to bring those and follow along and, and be reading these uh, ahead of time and living it through the week. Again, this is part of our uh, short stories by Jesus. Uh, as a church, uh, and many small groups are doing this as, as a curriculum, a leadership, uh, or a, a, a Bible study. Um, but it's uh, uh, something that will be our themes for worship. Then you can talk about it in small groups. Uh, there is a way you can still sign up. You can be a part of a group. You can see uh, Linda Manning or check in at the office. Uh, there are several groups that are, that are uh, doing this during the week. So again, continuing Luke, uh, and it's a pretty good passage beginning at verse uh, 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that it belongs to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to be one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, and, but here I am dying of hunger? I will get up. And go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what's going on? And he replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is a reading from God for the people of God. A few years ago, I went to a church in Clinton, Iowa, and 
there on the wall, um, I saw this sign. It's a scripture verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.11. You can read it there. Aim for perfection. Now, one of the things about the scriptures, it's powerful to read it, but then also apply it and ask ourselves, what does this mean? I want you to think for a moment. Aim for, for, for perfection. What do you think that means? Hmm. Now, just briefly, uh, turn to a neighbor. We're not going to talk. This is not going to be hard. Just, just what do you think it means in a nutshell? One sentence. What do you think? Aim for perfection. What would you say? Tell, tell it to the person next to you. Aim for for perfection. Okay? We're talking about how we interpret the scriptures and how do we find meaning in them. Obviously, there was written, somebody put this sign there as a way to help people uh, learn from the Word of God and determine what does it mean. Now, uh, for this sign in particular, I want to show you the full setting, though, uh, now. Is there any question about whoever put that sign there knows what it means? Don't turn to your neighbor. Don't talk about this. <laughs> but in terms of that scripture, he's, you know, the person, probably the janitor, might have been the trustees, had something specific in mind, and you know what it is, don't you? From the context on what's, uh, what's going on around it. We're talking about uh, how we come to the scriptures and hear from God. We want to hear what God has for us, for you. And we've been talking about how Jesus would use parables and stories and invite people to say, now, what do you think this means? And really to get, uh, to really understand it, we have to look at the context, uh, when it was said and who it was said to. And, and then what is it saying to me now? And what does it mean for me? You know, this past week we've had a, a pretty significant uh, anniversary uh, for September 11th. And I want to show you a picture now. And, and I want to show you two pictures, and I want to ask you which of these is true. Okay? Uh, here's a picture of what we remember would have happened uh, on September 11th those uh, years ago. And consider, is this true? Now, a second picture, again, that was created after September 11, and I want to ask you a question. Is this true? Now, think about it. Uh, the image of a, of a picture, a photograph, I mean, it's true in the sense of it creates a, an image of a snapshot. of That's what you would have seen there at that time. But in terms of what does this, well, then the other, I mean, so clearly, uh, Clearly, this is true. I mean, you would anybody doubt that this is true? But the other picture here never happened. Statue of Liberty never bent over, never cried, never changed, never moved. Uh, so there's a, a picture, an image of something you could say never really happened. But my question to you is, is this true? And why? Because it's conveying some meaning. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, the picture on the left is true in terms of the photograph, but there's no meaning involved. I almost say, which, which one is more true? Well, if you want to talk about meaning and what does this mean, and, and the author who, who drew this picture, I mean, somebody else could draw a different picture uh, of September 11 and have a completely different meaning. But at least from the, the, the author, the, the cartoonist who drew that picture, you know what he meant. What a sadness, what a tragedy that was. Now, the, the, what we're thinking about today is that in many ways the, the, the scriptures are more like the editorial cartoon than they are the photograph. Um, our author, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, Amy Jill Levine, who writes a uh, the book that we're being using as a resource to complement our study of the scriptures. You know, it talks about every parable, every part of scripture requires some type of interpretation to get at what it means. And more specifically, what does it mean for us? And really to get at to the heart of it, what is God wanting to say to us through the scriptures, through the word, 
and through our uh, sharing in that. And that's what we're always about, and that's what we're doing as we're looking to these parables, these stories of Jesus. Now, would, will you pray with me? Loving God, we want to hear from you. We want to know what you think. We want to know what you would say to us. And you've spoken to us through your word. But it's not a photograph. It's an image. It's a picture. It's a story in which you invite us into a conversation, a relationship, so that we can hear from you and walk with you as we walk with one another, as we live together. And as the body of Christ together, we come to these scriptures, these words, and seek your meaning for us. And so may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, how many of you in, um, in your daily routine of when you have your meal and you sit around the table have a place where you sit every time the same place? And if there's a family, there's a place for each person uh, in your family. Is that true for anybody else? Kind of routine, that's their place, that's their place, that's their place. And so if someone's not there, what? There's an empty chair. And you know they're not there. You feel that they're not there. You know, as Linda and I have been living in our new house, uh, we're having to get used to, okay, I mean, we're kind of settling into, okay, she sits there and I sit here uh, when we have our meals. There was a day when we had all five of our children and I sat there and she sat there and Dan sat here and Jesse sat here and there was a place in every meal and that's where they sat every time. Of course, as they went off to college and things kind of changed and moved, to, so that's why we're now getting into our, our next routine, but we're getting into the routine where, you know, you're sitting in my place or that, that's, that, that's where I sit, you know. If you've got that type of thing, you just know it, you feel it of where everyone belongs. And when there's an empty chair, you know it, and you're aware of it. Well, the parables today, I, I think in some ways that image of, uh, you know, are we all here might be one way to, to summarize all three of them. Are we all here at the table of God, at the banquet that God has prepared for us? Now, if you look at the setting, again, uh, as, uh, as Jesus was, or as Luke records these three stories, and as uh, Dr. Levine said, you know, she kind of takes them all three together. It seems like, you know, if you look at them as a whole, you, we might have some additional meaning that we wouldn't pick up if we looked at them separately. And look at the context that it begins, chapter 15. Now, all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to him, to Jesus. But then the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's the context by which Jesus went on to, to tell these stories, these parables. Now, one of the things that I really appreciate about uh, Dr. Levine is she brings to the scriptures a, a, a perspective that over time, many times, uh, Christians and people have interpreted the scriptures without really taking into a full uh, account the setting in which they were spoken. And, and she's really good at kind of pointing out there's oftentimes a lot of anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish perspectives that, that we read into the scriptures. She's helped me see at different times that I, I wasn't even aware of that. And so oftentimes it looks like the Pharisees and the scribes, they were the bad guys. And Jesus was there to kind of speak against them. And over time and over history, what that can be translated down to or passed on to, it's the Jews are the bad guys. And the Christians are the good guys. And Jill is saying that's just not accurate in terms of when Jesus, I mean, if we go back to the time when Jesus spoke, he was speaking to the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jewish people that were all around him. And so when when uh, the, the setting is Jesus is speaking with sinners and tax collectors, and, and he's, he's having a ta he's at the meal with them. He's, at a, he's dining with them. They're all around the table eating together. And some of them are grumbling about, well, that's not our, I mean, they're tax collectors. They're the sinners. What are you talking with them for? 
And so the traditional interpretation, or the, sometimes the traditional interpretation can be that, you know, this is a way of thinking of, of uh, Christians who repent and come to Jesus. And uh, in the story of the prodigal son, like the older son, is like uh, Jewish folks who, who don't uh, recognize the benefit of, you know, the Christians who come to, who repent and come to Jesus and so on. And, and uh, Jill is saying that just wasn't, the people wouldn't have thought of that at all when they heard these stories. There was no Christian church at that point. Jesus was speaking with Jewish folks, and so to try to think about what he was saying at the time, what was, what was the intent? And it takes some, some effort to try to imagine uh, what the setting was at the time, and then to think about, okay, so then what does that mean for us? So Jesus begins with the, the two stories about the, the shepherd who has uh, one sheep uh, who's lost, who's not there. And he notices it, and as uh, Dr. Levine points out, he, he must have noticed it because he was counting. He was, he, you know, in a 99 sheep, he knew them all. Now, again, the impracticality of would you notice, <laughs> I mean, how would you notice one out of 99 being gone unless you're counting somehow you're aware of who's at the table? I know what, at times when, when Linda and I would go on vacation with the kids, it would always be one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. You know, anywhere we're at, you know, just always counting. But can you imagine one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, up to ninety-nine? So without getting too much into the detail about that, the whole idea is the shepherd recognized somebody wasn't at the table. And the importance of, of counting and being aware who's there and missing them when they're not. In the same way, now it's, it's a little bit easier to conceive. You go from a 99 sheep or 100 sheep down to just 10, 10 coins. And so the woman who uh, has a 10 coins and she loses one now, again, you can read into thing 10 coins. This is a pretty wealthy woman then. Or she's got some significant wealth perhaps, and so that might have meant something to the things that Jesus day that we maybe don't even pick up to today. It says when she uh, goes looking, for, uh, loses one again, she realizes one is gone. She goes out, you know, sweeps the house until she finds it, and then rejoices. Again, Jesus is trying to make a point, as Luke tells it, that, uh, uh, you know, how God rejoices when someone comes to the table who was missing. But then we go from 100 to 10, now just to 2. And Jesus starts out, there was a man who had two sons. Again, one of the things I really appreciate about Dr. Levine's uh, reading some of her materials, to a Jewish audience, it would have been like uh, uh, similar perhaps to somebody saying like, a man walked into a bar and, well, you know there's a joke that's coming. You know, it's a format. And so to say, uh, you know, a man had two sons, a Jewish audience would have perhaps automatically gone to, uh, a, you know, Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel, and the difficulties between the two of them. And Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And each of those stories, the younger son is the one who, who does well. I mean, it's almost like they were set up. I mean, to, to realize a man had two sons, and, and as parables often go, uh, you know, the hearers were all ready f for what's going to happen. But Jesus would always uh, often turn it away to what they maybe wouldn't expect. And so as the story goes on, uh, it talks about the younger son that you know it. He, he, he wanted to go off on his own. He went and he wasted all of his father's wealth. Uh, he decided to come back. The father greeted him and welcomed him. And the older brother was resentful and says, I've been working all this time. And I didn't get a fatted calf. We didn't have a party for my friends. And now this son of yours, see, he doesn't even acknowledge the relationship. This son of yours comes back and look at what you do. And the father says, oh, son, you know, and, and I've never really thought about it. Was Did the father maybe overlook the son? It's not so much about the son, but the father might have not been counting appropriately. You see, that kind of changes the perspective where we think if the father is God, depending on how we interpret it, to say if we're in the father's role, uh, are there times where we're not paying attention to our sons, both of our sons? You see, the challenge is how we find meaning of, of what this is to us in the varied ways that we can find all kinds of meaning that we'll need God's perspective, God's help on decide what it means for us. Anyway, Dr. Levine suggests maybe it's the father's a part of the learning is to count both sons, to give both sons the attention that they need. 
But he says to the son, you know, everything I've got is yours. I love you. You're, you're my son no matter what. But this other son, uh, this brother of yours, see, he reestablishes the connection. He's your brother. It's like he was lost and he was found. He wasn't at the table, and now he's here. And we've got to rejoice. Now, here's the point. The story doesn't end with a, here's what it means. We don't know what happens. Did the brother repent? Did, I mean, did he go in and he welcomed the brother? Uh, you know, Dr. Levine says, you know, maybe this, there's a story about how do we get along in a household? Uh, maybe this is just about fathers and sons and families, and can they get along together, and how do we live together as, as a family and care for one another? And I guess that gets us to, to now that what we're trying to do is, is asking God, what do you want to say to us through this scripture? I mean, I want to give you a question. Are we all here? That's one of the ways to think about it. Are we all here in our family? It might be just how we get along within our, within our regular families. Are we all here in the church and, and welcoming people in our community? Are we all here in the community? our nation and seeing each other as family members, that there's a place at the table for them. And if we're not, are we willing to be open to them and, and mend relationships and go out, to, out of our way to welcome others, to go where the people are in the spirit of Asbury <laughs> and, and sit and eat with sinners and tax collectors and listen to them and earn their trust and develop a relationship with them so that they too can be part of the family. Because there's a place for them, just as there's a place for us. So the challenge is, what does God want to say to you through these stories? I can't tell you. I mean, because I'm not God. Um, and so as we... Um, read the Bible and share it with one another. Part of it in our United Methodist tradition, we say we look to the scriptures first, but tradition and reason and experience and one another and God's Holy Spirit to say, so God, help me see who's not here. Help me be the one uh, to bring about peace and reconciliation in our family. God, help me know what you want me to do and where you want me to go to bring your peace on earth as it is in heaven. Are you willing to listen for God's word to you this week with the help of the people around you? Uh, it'll be great. God has something wonderful for us. It might shake us up a bit, but it will be good. May we be about God's will and following his word asking who's not here 